I don't know why. So for some reason, my one computer does that. I don't know what the difference is. I've tried all settings anyway. So we are now recording. Um, so we're uh, going to pick up where we left off with social influence. So um, in, in the chapter, it discusses the difference between conformity and compliance and obedience. It also uh, describes how uh, principles of authority and social validation, they really help us to choose correctly and, and understand how factors um, in, within the individual, within the person uh, and the situation influence their, their use, right? How they, how they respond. So norms and, and like this reciprocity are really exp explained to link uh, or, and they're linked to uh, gaining social approval because we all have that need for affiliation. Most people, a vast majority of people have that need for affiliation, not everybody. Uh, especially those that live out in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. But uh, anyway, so um, those factors in the person and the situation that influence whether we go along to social gain or, or to gain social approval or, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is that their, their goal is to do. Because if you think of psychology, social psychology, it's always goal oriented. We're always after something, right? So um, anyway, the, the four commitment initiating influence tactics that were described um, along with factors in the person. You know, we talked about how some of the, the, those factors like persuasion can get us to alter our attitudes and change, ultimately change our, our behaviors through our attitudes, right? So anyway, um, so we'll, we'll work through some of those, um, some of those uh, thoughts with, with social issues. So I'm going, our social influence, I'm going to share my screen so you can all follow along. If I can find it, social influence. All right, there we go. All right, so um, as usual, um, we'll go through kind of our, our myths uh, facts and myths or truths truths and falsehoods or whatever uh whatever you want to call it um fact or falsehoods all right so um chimps are more likely to yawn after observing another chip yawn what do you think true 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 absolutely because uh i mean we're we're kind of more evolved than chimps at least we think so um but we kind of have that same thing right uh, what causes that? I mean, has, has, have you heard anything about what might cause that? It's like when if, if someone yawns and then it's like uh, you want to do the same. It's um, what's the word? Um, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, yeah, I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> it's. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Once you when, when someone do something, you want to do the same. It's, Hearing neurons. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. So we we see somebody doing something, and the activity in our brain almost mirrors what the activity is in their brain when they're doing it, just with us observing it. So uh, if somebody is relaxed enough to be yawning, then um, we we kind of get into that relaxation, that desire to be relaxed. And that could be an explanation for why we yawn after somebody else yawns, right? So uh, good. I mean, I knew you were getting there. So yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that. All right. Um, next one. Most people would refuse to obey an authority figure who told them to hurt an innocent person. False. Okay. False. False. Yeah. Why? What, what uh, leads you to think it's false? The Stanley Milgram exper yeah. um, experiment that we just did. Absolutely. In fact, it showed opposite of that. It showed almost three fourths, three quarters of people would uh, hurt an innocent person if told to do so. And our history is littered with examples of that from um, uh, from Germany's uh, Nazis to uh, Abu Ghraib to uh, the prison in Iraq to, um, I mean, there, there are just countless, um, countless examples throughout history that, that people, I mean, we're witnessing that right now. What, what are we seeing that? Where are we seeing that happen? Russia. 
Yeah, yeah. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, right? A lot of uh, pillaging and a lot of harm, harming of civilians because they're being told to. Uh, they're not taking information in for themselves. And, and these are sons and husbands and boyfriends. And, uh, and I, I'm using men because uh, as far as I know, it's, it's all men that are out there in the field um, uh, taking, taking over. Uh, and so uh, it, as far as the Russian forces go. So absolutely, um, they're being told to do something and they do it blindly, many of them, right? Um, so studies of college and professional athletic events indicate that home teams win about six to 10 games. I actually don't know what that uh, might've been. Uh, yeah, it was a little confusing. Studies of college and professional athletic events and uh, win about six to 10 games. Um, yeah, not sure what that even alludes to, so we'll skip it. Um, uh, 10, I'm not sure if it's six to 10 games over their competitors or anyway, maybe it's six out of 10 games. Uh, anyway, that was poorly written. I apologize. Uh, how about the next one? Individuals pull harder in a team of tug of war than uh, when they uh, pull in one on one tug of war. What do you think? False. False. True. Okay. That's actually false. Okay. People pull less. Diffusion of responsibility, right? We'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, bystander effect, right? We think that other people are going to be pulling the weight. But if somebody uh, has a perception that they're, they're acting alone, they will uh, actually pull harder, okay? Um, the higher the, the morale and harmony of a social group, the more likely uh, are its members to make a good decision. What do you think? True. True. Any other answers there? True. Nobody think it's actually false. Uh, the higher the morale and the harmony of a social group, the more of an identity they take. They, they almost gain the, their identity, their group identity almost gains an arrogance about it. Like they can't do anything wrong because they're so well and so efficient in that, or in that group. Um, that they could overlook major mistakes. And we've seen that again throughout history. We've seen that with Bay of Pigs invasion, uh, we've seen with the Challenger explosion, um, probably 9-11 was, was uh, a lot of that. We had an arrogance about the United States that we let down our guard, right? Um, so yeah, uh, throughout history, we have, have a lot of um, uh, examples of that. All right, so let's talk about conformity, all right? So back in the 1950s, Solomon Ash uh, did uh, performed an experiment that um, he called the line experiment, where he asked participants which line is equal to the standard line. So let's kind of go around the room. I mean, all of you hopefully can see this on your screen. What out of one, two, and three, what line on the left do you think matches the line on the right? What number? Two. Two. Right. Okay. Okay. Nobody thinks any differently. Two. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that would be the normal response for somebody. So what he did, uh, what Solomon Ash did, was uh, he had seating. Uh, he had seating set up so that the Confederates would answer first. He had, I think it was, um, he had ten participants in the room all together, and he picked uh, not, the first nine of them were Confederates. They were people that he hired to uh, deceive, to answer a certain way. So he had all nine of the Confederates uh, answer first and had them answer incorrectly. So might may have had them answer three since it looks so close. So when he got to the 10th person who is the actual only participant in that experiment, what do you think the Confederate, uh, what do you think the, uh, the participant gave? So, the same uh, answer. Yeah, the same answer as everybody else. More than a third of all participants uh, gave the wrong answer. Be even though they knew what the right answer was, they didn't want to uh, look a fool or they didn't want to uh, be outside of that group or anything. They, their need for affiliation outweighed their need for uh, being right or being correct in that moment. So we can, uh, we can certainly see that uh, throughout, again, throughout history. Um, all right, so conformity increases when a person is made to 
feel incompetent, okay? Um, uh, so what does that look like? Uh, like if we get somebody that, uh, like gang mentality, like if they want to um, get into a gang, right? That influence is so great because usually that uh, individual feels incompetent, either from a parent's perspective, like maybe uh, parents make them feel less than, or they don't feel connect connected, or there's some kind of dysfunction going on in the home. Um, so that person seeks an identity, and they usually do that in a group of people um, that that uh, might seem well, uh, well, like very efficient and and cohesive, right? So the group has at least three people, um, but it's usually not a huge crowd, or at least not initially. Um, and the rest of the group is is unanimous, right? So we see the conformity increase uh, when the person admires the status and attractiveness of the group, right? So if there's some prestige uh, fraternity or sorority that, that uh, makes it hard for people to get into, um, they, they might uh, adopt some of their values in order to, to try and infiltrate that group, get into that group. Uh, conformity also increases when the person has not made any prior commitment to any response, right? So they haven't uh, committed to one way or another, um, but uh, again, that admiration is still there. So we're kind of seeing a mix of all of these things. Um, the more that they meet these criteria, the more likelihood conformity is going to increase. So we'll see it also increase when group members observe uh, the person's behavior, right? If, if uh, all the members are observing them and they're giving them kind of the go ahead or the green light, uh, they're going to uh, conform, right? Um, person's culture encourages respect for social standards, right? We see that in collectivist cultures. We, uh, we also see it in individualistic cultures, right? Because individualists have personal goals they wanna meet. And if they want, if those goals are aligned with getting into a group um, that also has those goals, they may also do that, right? But uh, collectivist culture, we do see a high increase of conformity, okay? So reasons for conforming. Um, trying to think of, uh, yeah, let's, so what I would like to do, just take a, a quick moment here and um, let's see. I don't have really enough to. So let 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 me uh, let let me break you off to discuss a little bit. Actually, I don't know how I'm going to break you off on this. Um, what are some things in your life or things that you've observed that people conform blindly? They they just conform because the group is doing it. What are some examples? Maybe we'll just have a group discussion with with us instead of breaking off into groups. Like if the leader of the group is bullying someone, the people might follow along in the group. Okay, okay. So like in high school or or elementary school or, or something, somewhere in grade school, hopefully not college. I mean, I don't see that. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen that necessarily happen in college, but uh, have you? Has anybody seen that happen in, in college? Not in college, no. Okay, okay. Um, so why is that? Why, why is it uh, that childhood, uh, usually in adolescence, we see that decreasing? Why is that more prevalent? In, in, uh... So that like they don't get bullied, like if they help the main person bully the other person, then they won't get bullied. Okay, okay. So they're kind of doing it. They're jumping on a bandwagon uh, in order to for, for self preservation, right? Okay. What, what else is going on in adolescence? What do we see happening right around you know, 13 to 17, 18 years old? Really beyond that. I mean, it can happen a little bit each, each side, but we mostly see that happen. You know, like middle school to middle high school, uh, we, we usually see this happen. What, what, what's going on with the, with the adolescent? What, what is their mind doing? What are they trying to do? They're trying to fit in with a crowd and clicks and um you know yeah different clicks pretty much they're trying to figure out who they are and who you know what group they go with absolutely yeah and if you remember back in developmental psychology we talked about 
Eric Erickson's eight stages of development, right? Do, do you remember which one would be applicable to uh, adolescent stage, right around two to 16 years old? 17 years old, I think. I'm really testing your knowledge here, <laughs> seeing how much. How about identity versus what? I know we're reaching back in the semester. Identity versus role confusion. Okay, I'll give you give you a, uh, a freebie here. Uh, so, what happens during that that stage? You know, we go through the trust versus mistrust, uh, autonomy versus. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, oh my gosh, I forgot. Guilt versus shame. All right, is that ringing a bell? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, what we see in uh, in this stage is role versus identity, I'm sorry, identity versus role confusion. So um, teenagers in that stage are more interested in, uh, in trying to build their identity. They want, uh, they're looking for status, they're looking for materials, they're looking for resources, and they usually try and find that through groups. So if they see a group building, you know, and they see a, a group jumping on uh, a weaker person, then they're going to be more aligned, more interested in being with that group than they might be with uh, helping out that person or, or at least intervening, right? So, uh, and I'm not saying that everybody's built that way, but for the most part, like if somebody is really identity seeking and they're really looking for groups to be affiliated with, they're more likely to engage in, in conforming to those bad behaviors of that group, right? So- I have a question. Uh, yep, go ahead. Well, not really a question. It's like when I, when I, when I'm remembering when I was in high school, I didn't really like care about what my role was. Mm -hmm. Like I just had a group of friends that we kind of stick to ourselves and we kind of focused on school and what we wanted to do in school and graduate instead of actually like conforming to like a lot of things we just focused on and like we were friends we were like a small group and then mm -hmm. we focused on school but we didn't like want to seek out like attention or anything yeah yeah and and uh there there are a lot of students a lot of kids that fall in that camp right i'm not saying this applies to everybody but i mean nonetheless you did seek out a group that had a goal that was similar to what you were looking to do right and and your goal was to be your own person, not uh, get into those mean groups and graduate probably with good grades, right? You found others that had that similar goal, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's still group finding. And, and luckily you had a, an identity that was secure enough that you could focus on that. But if you can imagine like somebody that comes from a very confused household where they might have a lot of shouting or a lot of... Uh, um, lack of nurturing from their parental relationships or their caregivers, uh, they might be confused. They might not uh, really understand, or if they have a bad relationship with their teacher, uh, teachers or something, they really hate school. They're going to be more rebellious and probably engage in uh, behaviors that are not necessarily pro-social. So they would be seeking groups that are like them. And those groups will probably uh, get in, involved in bad behaviors like uh, doing drugs picking on people, uh, vandalizing, that sort of thing. So uh, again, I mean, it depends on what the individual's goals are, how strong those goals are and attitudes. We talked about attitudes last lecture and how that aligns with uh, the strength of the need for getting into a group, okay? So there's a lot of things that mix here, but conforming is something that we do in that group, right? So if you can imagine, uh, Louis, that was you that, that brought that up, right? Or Liz? No, it was Zach. Yeah. Oh, Zach. Okay, I'm sorry. I saw I saw uh, Louis highlighted there. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, I forgot the question I was going to ask you, Zach. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So let's uh, let's say that that this group for a long time, maybe how long was your your group together for? Oh man, I have to think back. Um, I think it all started maybe my, maybe my sophomore year. Uh, we all were kind of like like-minded people. We liked video games and anime, and we focused on school and our own selves. And it all started. I think I think it was my sophomore year. 
I don't know about my freshman year, maybe, maybe my freshman year, but I, I it was probably my sophomore year. That's all kind of where I remember. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so it, it was a pretty good amount of time. So probably up, up through graduation. Yeah. Well, uh, so let's imagine that you had a pretty cohesive group, uh, up for a couple of years and all of a sudden the group decides that they want to do something really crazy, really weird. And, and maybe they're going to go out and, and, uh, experiment with pot. Okay. Uh, just as an example, I'm not saying this happened. Um, but you are the only person in that group that, that, uh, uh, decided or chose or had a value that you didn't want to try that those forces, because that group is already formed, it's efficient, it's aligned with your goals, that single act, that single behavior, uh, with a majority of the group wanting to do that is enough to influence people to, to act that way. And I know what you're saying that I would never do anything like that, but we know that that's not the case. <laughs> We've done that with research. We see that people that have strong values against not doing So you're like saying that if a group is like there, mm -hmm. someone could conform to that group and, and try it, even though they might not want to. Right. Yeah, exactly. Peer pressure, right? That's what we yeah. do with peer pressure. Absolutely. If you trust that group and you trust that you've spent that uh, a majority of those years trusting that that group is making good decisions and then they decide to do something that counteracts what that individual's values and attitudes are, it's a high probability that that person will conform with that group. Okay. Not saying it's a hundred percent of the time, and like I said, it doesn't mean that anybody was neglected or abused or anything as a child. It just means that we are people, we have a need for affiliation, and there's a good chance that we would conform with the group, even if it's against something that we want to do, especially if uh, that group is well-established and, and we trust them, right? Uh, we can kind of see that happening in political parties right now, right? Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into too many examples on that, but all right. What, what are some other examples of conforming? Uh, bullying was a great one. I think that was a, a wonderful one. How about uh, something a little bit more in the adult realm, maybe at work or at school or something like that? What, what, where does conformity that somebody, a group or individual tells you to do something you conform? Going to bars. If you, you know, you have a group of friends that like going to bars and maybe you haven't really been one be there but your group is like tight and they're like hey let's go to a bar mm -hmm. okay yeah maybe starting up behaviors like that going to the bar you know going to the bar isn't necessarily a bad thing um you know, if somebody has addictive behaviors that could turn out to be a bad thing uh for that that individual but absolutely yeah so um what are some uh, we talked about some of these already so i might just uh just give you some uh, buzzwords here to go along with it. So we have normative social influence, which is a desire to gain approval or avoid disapproval from the group, right? So we talked about that with, uh, with the really good study group that, you know, they've been making good decisions for years and all of a sudden the group as a whole decides to do something a little bit different. The uh, likelihood for that person, uh, that individual that goes against what their moral fibers are might consider acting with the group, conforming with the group, because they don't want to be, um, dis they don't want a disapproval from the group. They don't want to be ousted or ostracized or, any or anything like that. We as humans fear ostracization, ostra ostra oh my God, ostracization. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, it's a big word. Um, uh, yeah, uh, being ostracized from, from a group is, is very terrifying for us because again, that need for affiliation, right? Um, informational uh, social influences, right? Others' opinions and behaviors provide information about reality. We talked about QAnon uh, last, last lecture and what their influence is, just information in the absence of any kind of uh, real information, right? All right. We all learned about Stanley Milgram. We had a video that talked about it and it looked at obedience, right? Not only conformity, but obedience. Now, what's the difference between conformity and obedience? We talked, we said what conformity is. It's that social influence that causes us to do something. What is obedience? Think about the, the movie. Oh, actually, it's right here on the screen. 
compliance from a behavior in response to direct command from a port person in, in authority, person in authority. I think I talk for a living. Um, so who's in authority? Who do we, who do we think is in authority over us? Parents, family, even like president, government. Okay. Okay. Uh, police Parents. officers. What's that? I would say maybe police officers in a police officers, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what, 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 how did we learn about police? I mean, what is it about police officers that, uh, that we decide that we are going to be obedient, that we're going to listen to them? They enforce laws and rules that we're supposed to abide by. Okay. Okay. So, um, like what gives us an indication that, uh, that, that, that somebody's in authority. Like their title or badge, maybe? Yeah, yeah. How about that? Somebody with a badge, somebody that's wearing a badge uh, would give us uh, that indication that, oh my gosh, you know, they, they might be important. They might be a federal agent. They might be a local police officer. They might be state, you know, whatever. We see somebody with a badge. We are trained to think that that is somebody that deserves some kind of uh, respect or something because they're, they're an authority. What about other types of authority? We said parents, um, like if, uh, yeah, uh, what are some, what would be somebody else? Like if you saw and they talked to you and they told you something about, you know, it could be anything, uh, you would likely believe them. What other situations do you think? Like maybe like teachers or bosses. Yeah, yeah. What happened with the Milgram experiment? What what were the uh, researchers wearing? Lab like coats. lab coats. Yeah, they were wearing lab coats, which gave the impression that they knew what they were doing. They had lab coats and clipboards and 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 glasses, thick glasses, right? So we stereotyped and said, well, that might be somebody that's important and intelligent, and and we listened to them, right? Um, and they showed that again, three quarters of the people uh, within that within that experiment uh, uh, were obedient, right? Um, so anyway, Stanley Milgram showed that somebody could be pressured to uh, commit an immoral act. Let's see here. I'm gonna play this video here for you. Not entirely pleased about that, but it did, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button there. All right, so what what'd you think? Like I said, it, uh, it's nothing new. We watched the video. So what uh, what what did you pick out of, of that experiment? That was interesting. I, I think it's it's insane how how these people trust somebody like that, like somebody that doesn't know anything about what 400 volts feel like, you know, that has no clue what electricity is like, like for them to trust somebody that they're not killing somebody behind that room, for them not realize that if something happens, it's their fault, it's not the whoever is behind you telling you it's an experiment. At the end yeah. of the day, it's going to be whoever's giving the voltage, that's, that's whose fault is going to be. So it's crazy how we don't we don't think of those factors at the moment when they're right. doing that. Right, and and we uh, defer really we defer that responsibility to somebody else that's telling us to do that, right? Yeah. Because um, that that happens. Uh, we we saw that with uh, uh, Nazi Germany, right? Um, uh, I'm trying to look up the. Um, so that happened. I'm trying to remember. It was like back in the. 2005, I believe. Um, there, there's a, a prison. I know this is probably uh, you, many of you were probably little kids at the time, but there was a prison uh, called Abu Ghraib um, out in in Iraq that uh, the U.S. Army had garrisoned and used to prison imprison um, Iraqi soldiers and, and terrorists. Right. So what was happening? Uh, over time, I mean, this this camp, this garrison had 
been available. I mean, it, it had been in use for years. And they were finding that some of the prison guards there, some of the, the soldiers were treating the prisoners completely disrespectful. I mean, uh, uh, humiliating, just egregious, you know, just uh, uh, to the point of almost rape. And um, I'm not gonna say pillaging, but uh, it, it, it was demeaning. I mean, they were forcing them to do horrible things, inhumane acts and embarrassing acts, um, because that was the culture for them to do that. They, they were given kind of this lateral, uh, this, this um, I guess, wide berth to operate indiscriminately, however they wanted to, in order to treat the prisoners like prisoners and get them to give up information. So anyway, it wasn't realized, similar to what we saw in this, the, in the Stanford prison experiment last last week or last lecture is we saw this we saw this ideology that that formed everybody had their roles and the prisoners were taking it yeah they didn't have a choice in it but these these guards these um, you know some of them were very well decorated and didn't really outwardly have a bad bone in their body seemingly that that's how people reported them anyway uh, but when they got into this situation they acted atrociously, right? So because they were able to, to diffuse that, uh, they were able to de default that responsibility to somebody else, to the commander or whatever. So anyway, we can see that in um, most recent times that some of these forces <clears throat> still, excuse me, are still in play. Um, all right, so how do we fix this? I mean, what, what are some you know, we, we don't want to think of ourselves as being vulnerable to these social influences. We are, but how do we protect ourselves or how do we advocate for others to not get into this situation? Have morals. Okay, okay. We all have morals. Some are stronger in others in some areas or others, you know, uh, like for example, um, some people might say that they have a strong moral uh judgment against people that, that, that agree that abortion is okay, right? Um, and some people have kind of more of the capacity that it is okay to take an a, a unborn fetus's life. And some people say, uh, I wouldn't do it, but I don't, I'm not going to mind if anybody else does that. We can see that spectrum of morals or that morality just in one issue but yet you get to a different issue and they could, and people that didn't have a strong stance on that might have a stronger stance in that area. So it's really hard to gauge, you know, unless you know how a person stands on each and every individual issue, it's really hard to gauge that, to see um, maybe somebody that participated in this had a strong sense of morality and, and didn't believe that somebody has the right to tell me to hurt somebody else. Maybe they've been through that experience before or somebody had that conversation with them and now they're guarded. They, since they went through that experience, they know in their head that they're pretty well mentally prepared to handle a situation like that, as is maybe hopefully many of you would be, right? If you get into a situation where somebody asks you to harm somebody else, just because that's what we do in this group, right? Uh, hopefully this information will, will help you. So that's one way is education, letting people know that this force does exist and that this can cause people to do things that they wouldn't normally do. And hopefully that would be enough to um, help out with that. So anyway, uh, just some data here. They, they saw a percentage of participants who obeyed the experimenter in Milgram's follow-up experiments, right? So some of the ones that they tried later showed that there really wasn't much of a difference, right? It's still a majority, almost 70% of them were, were um, administering up to a lethal dose, uh, 435 to 450 volts of electricity, right? Um, so what kind of situations increase obedience, similar to what we saw with, with influence and, and conformity, right? So the person given the orders is close at hand and perceived to be the legitimate authority, right? So again, we can diffuse that uh, our responsibility to that authority. Um, that, that figure authority is associated with prestigious institution. So for example, um, uh, and, and I'm not picking on institutions in any way, but what, what University of Phoenix, right? So if you had a professor at the University of Phoenix telling you to do something unethical or 
the professor at uh, a distinguished professor at the University of Harvard, which one do you think is likely going to get more of an obedience, right? Probably the Harvard, because they know what they're doing. Harvard, everybody knows what Harvard is. It's the best of the best. It's the hardest institution to get into. So that professor must be very knowledgeable on something as opposed to a professor from, um, from the University of Phoenix or something like that. I, I don't know where hack falls in in that, <laughs> in that spectrum, uh, hopefully above University of Phoenix, but who knows? I mean, you, University of Phoenix, I'm, I'm picking on them. They, uh, they have a good school. Um, uh, I, I, I'm using them lightly because they are uh, online. They're mostly online. And I think there's this uh, general, I don't wanna say consensus, it's not really consensus, but um, kind of this impression that online universities aren't nearly as good as as uh, traditional brick and mortar schools, which I don't know. I think I think the the data is still out on that. I think there's a lot of things, a lot of benefits to going to online universities uh, over brick and mortar, especially if you're a working individual, because not everybody has the luxury of taking off eight years to become a doctor, right? It certainly didn't take me eight years because I worked full time in in, uh, in the military. Okay, so. Um, Another, sorry, that kind of took a little bit of a detour there. So what kind of uh, institutions increase obedience? Uh, victim is depersonalized or another room, right? And you saw in the Milgram experiment that the person wasn't even in the same room. We heard their voice, we heard the reaction to the shock, but we did not see them or interact with them, right? So uh, no role models for disobeying uh, the authority figure. So nobody else is disobeying. Now, everybody is following along and we kind of see that conformity once again. So if we saw somebody else in the room say that they were giving up, we would probably see the participant also give up as well, uh, refuse to, to do that. And of course, cute little, uh, anim or not animation, um, comic here uh, saying, sure, I follow the herd, not out of brainless obedience, mind you, but out of deep and abiding respect for the concept of community, right? Because again, we value we recognize that there's power in numbers and there's strength in numbers, right? All right, so on to our, our next topic, which is social facilitation, okay? So this is a tendency uh, for weaknesses or strengths in performance to be magnified when people are watching, right? So again, going back to that example of conformity, say you have a group of, of individuals and students that are rel relatively well-mannered and well-behaved, one, one day the majority of the group decides to do something incorrectly. That disapproval through social facilitation is strong enough that we look, we feel like everybody is watching us, right? So that might explain why a person um, is, is, uh, is acting a certain way. So during social facilitation, they've got an example of basketball players here is the, the performer is physiologically aroused in front of an audience. So they get amped up, right? We actually see this. Um, uh, have any of you been or, or seen uh, hypnosis like in a group? Has anybody ever witnessed that? Has yeah. Anybody, yeah, what, can you share that? What happens? Um, they kind of just act like nobody's watching them really. Okay. Okay. In uh, like, what was the, what was the task that the hypnotist or the mentalist or whatever asked them to perform? Um, I'm not really sure on what it was, but I think it was like dancing or something like they, he hypnotized them into all dancing on stage okay. in front of everybody. Okay. Okay. Uh, for one of our, one of my lectures, I brought in a hypnotist or, or a mentalist. He went by mentalist and uh, he did something very similar. He had the crowd, uh, he, he selected somebody from the crowd and he, first of all, he tested their vulnerability. He wanted to test uh, how willing they were to conform. Um, now, why did, why do hypnotists do that? Why do uh, people, uh, why, why is that an interest for a mentalist or a hypnotist to test their conformity? their ability to conform. Why do you think that is? What would happen if somebody didn't believe that hypnotism worked, that was skeptical? What, how do you think that would 
how do you think they would perform under hypnosis? It probably wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. I, we know it wouldn't work. Um, there's a 99% chance it would not work, right? Uh, unless that person was secretly thinking that hypnotism is cool for whatever reason. But a majority of the time, hypnotism would not work because that person uh, uh, is believing it. So part of this, and one of the theories that we use why hypnotism works and people act a fool up on stage in front of a large group of people is because they're physiologically aroused in front of that audience. They are the center stage um, and they feel like they have to perform a certain way. So if, if they're a, in a suggestible state uh, and they are likely to conform to group standards and norms and they're put on a, under a spotlight, they will do just about anything you want them to do. Like, I, like dance like Ariana Grande or something like that, right? So um, that's uh, one of the ideas be uh, behind fa social facilitation is once we have, um, once we are in that spotlight, we're, we act a certain way. So the performer's most likely to uh, response is, is uh, strengthened um, and better performance if a performer is skilled at a task, is easy, and especially in front of a friendly audience, home field advantage, right? That, I think that's what they meant to say is um, six out of 10 uh, games would have been one, if you remember our initial question. So uh, if, they're, if they're in front of their audience that is supportive of them, they're likely to, to, to do well. Um, probably all don't remember what year was that. I think it was 2000. 14 Super Bowl. Does anybody remember that? Uh, it was the Seahawks versus versus uh, actually that might be a bad example, but versus the Broncos. Any NFL fans out there? Anybody remember that game? I think I do. I don't really remember it that well, but I'm an I NFL think I've fan, but I don't it. I don't remember the game at all. Okay, okay. I heard about it, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, um, not Eli Manning, Peyton Manning when he was quarterback. So they made it to the Super Bowl, Seahawks versus the uh, the uh, Broncos, Denver Broncos, and there was just so much energy in that stadium that everybody was cheering and and loud and in favor. I think they were in favor of the Seahawks. Um, that uh, Peyton Manning just was not able to perform. In fact, he was very very rattled. Uh, it was a complete shutout. I can't remember the score. I think it was like in the 30s to zero or something for a, and for a Super Bowl game. That's just unheard of. So anyway, um, that's an example of, it, it, you know, the Seahawks were probably emboldened by that energy. And then, of course, Denver, um, they felt like they, they had the forces against them, right? And again, uh, poor performances. Uh, if the performer is uh, poor or task is, is harder than usual, okay? Excuse me. So uh, let's talk about social loafing. Um, social loafing happens when, again, we have that diffusion of responsibility. Uh, less effort is exerted by individuals in a group, especially when the individual contributions are hard or separate from the whole, right? So how many of you have been in groups in high school or even college, like doing group work? Like you're, you're put into class groups. How does that go usually? Has anybody had a good experience with, with uh, like group projects? Either I will have to do all the work or someone in the group will help me. Okay. Okay. So, but do you usually have somebody in there that doesn't do anything or does very little? Yeah, yeah. most likely. Oh my yeah. God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, trust me. I've been, I actually, I think I, uh, I hate to say this. I probably was a social loafer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I did, I oftentimes did my part, but, uh, I'll, I'll be honest. I, uh, oftentimes I, if somebody was willing to do the work, I was usually letting them do it. Um, you know, uh, anyway, so I, I know how they go and I'm, I'm really on this quest to figure out a way to improve, uh, groups so that social lo loafing is less likely to occur. Um, so anyway, it's, it happens when, when somebody thinks that somebody else is doing all the work and they don't do that. And that was that tug of war question that we asked earlier on is when is somebody's strength greatest? Is it when they are in a group of people or when they're in, um, in a small 
uh, by themselves, right? And the answer is by themselves. Um, so people in the group, uh, they feel less accountable for their actions. So they're less likely to really get out in front and do anything, right? They're, they're going to, uh, especially if the task is difficult, they're going to just kind of take the easy route. And people in a group worry less about what others think, right? So if they're not judged in any way, then they're less likely to uh, perform. Um, and also people in the group may uh, view their contributions as dispensable. So, which means that they're, they, the people in the group don't find it as important. So one of the things I did with my group studies is I instituted like these peer reviews. So um, the peers were evaluating each other on the level of effort that they thought other people were doing. And what I saw was a significant improvement than if I were grading that person based on their contributions, because I was so far distance, I didn't have a daily interaction with them. So social loafing was likely to occur in those groups where they thought I was just holding them accountable. But when they thought that their peers were holding them accountable, I saw an uptick in their, their performance. Still had loafers, but not nearly as much, and, and they didn't... Uh, they didn't loaf around nearly as, as much as they, they did. Okay. De individuous, oh my gosh, de individuation, de individuation. Um, it happens when uh, somebody is in a crowd or group and they have really no discernible identity, right? They're, uh, they experience a diminished sense of self consciousness which means that they are no longer a person or they're no longer dealing with a person. We see this all the time in, in well let me let me get through these and then and then i'll ask you for examples um loss of uh normal restraints so we'll see what uh somebody might who might not act a certain way if they knew uh, that the person was watching or the person had some kind of opinion of them um they they, they act a little bit more horribly uh lower awareness of individual values and more likely to occur when there's anonymity when do we see that happen? What are some examples of de-individuation? What do you think? If somebody doesn't feel like the other person is actually a person, they just view them as like an actor or uh, somebody that's uh, just behaving a certain way, they don't actually look at them as a human individual with humanistic qualities. Am I making sense? Maybe in a, like a prison setting, I don't know. Good, yeah, absolutely, prison setting. Uh, we saw that with Stanley Milgrams, right? Uh, the, the student, there was a student and there was a teacher. They may not have known each other's names, but there was no person behind that, that wall. They were de-individualizing. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, what about road rage? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Do they view that other person as a mother or a father or a son or daughter or whatever, right? Do they view them as an actual human being? They view them as a target of aggression, right? Which is also part of, uh, of uh, social psychology is, is public or um, social aggression theories. Um, what about cyberbullying? Why do you think the individuation happens in this, in cyberbullying? Because you don't know the person. Would that I mean, you may, you may, but you're also kind of like hidden behind your screen and you can pretty much say whatever you want, I guess. Right. You don't see them as a person. You see them as, as, a, as an icon or a picture or something like that. Right, so absolutely. Um, next topic we have is, is group polarization, which is the enhancement of a group's prevailing tendencies um, and its self-amplifying effect in a group can be good, uh, it, it, which increases the determination and common uh, mission of the self-help groups, right? Uh, and polarizing effect can be bad, which could show pre prejudice uh, in groups, right? So, um, Oops, let me go, go back to, so what they're showing here in this chart here is, you know, prejudice is at a zero, that's a center line at a zero. So it doesn't 
doesn't really have uh, a, an occurrence whatsoever. So what happens is when a group that is, again, cohesive in their way, if they have a bad presentation, if they have a bad um, uh, low prejudice, then they're uh, like before their discussion um, of something that might be negative, they're likely to get worse, right? Uh, whereas if somebody has a positive, like a high prejudice group, um, their discussion among like-minded people tends to be strengthened uh, in, that, in that direction, if that makes sense, okay? I don't have any great examples of here, so we're just gonna kind of um, skip by that. The group think happens when, uh, we talked about that earlier, when a group think uh, results, a group think happens when the group members try to maintain harmony in a decision-making group. Right, so they don't want to be the odd man out, the odd person out. They they want to make the best decision that they can uh, as a group. Um, and, but the higher we talked about that, the higher efficiency of that group, the less likely. I, I'm sorry, the more likely they are to make mistakes. As example here, you may not know what that picture is. That was the Challenger explosion back in 1996 when the Challenger had um, exploded in midair. Um, what happened with that situation was that groupthink was very much at, at uh, the root of that because there were several individuals that spoke up later saying, I should have said something, I should have said something. Uh, right before the launch, there was, a, uh, there was ice built up on the tanker and uh, several of the heat shields. And it was uh, thought that by several people that um, they should not launch. However, they're NASA, they're big, they're badass, and that they, they cannot ever do anything wrong because they're the smartest people in the world. Well, that led to the fatality of seven individuals who were on board of that. that one of them was a, a school teacher. So anyway, that, uh, that's the ultimate outcome of, uh, of groupthink when it, can, when it can go bad. So those type of uh, behaviors, um, include examining few alternatives, right? We're on a path, we know what we're doing. We're not gonna deviate from this because we're good, we're smart and we're the best, right? Um, selective gathering of information. So they may only select what they want to hear as opposed to what they need to hear. Pressure to conform within the group, right? Again, uh, nobody wants to be the outlier. They don't, uh, anybody that was in that group for some reason or another did not feel that, um, that they were going to be viewed, uh, regarded as, as positive and pressure to withhold criticism. So if you have something bad to say, keep it to yourself. That's the mentality of groupthink um, and collective rationalization, right? So um, again, this was, this was the example of the shuttle, okay? All right, got another video for you here. Who knows best? An expert bookie? Yes. Or a random bunch of betters? Plugged in Wall Street hotshots? Or people like you and me? How about the smartest man in the world? Or these guys? The answer may surprise you. If you can get the right circumstances, groups of people can be remarkably smart. And the really strange thing is they can actually be smarter than the smartest person within them sometimes. It's just a theory. <laughs> James well, Sirwicky is not only a crowd pleaser with a best-selling book and a business column in The New Yorker, he's also a crowd champion. All that elbowing and jostling, he says, actually is a good thing. If you can figure out a way to tap into the knowledge that, say, a large group of people have, uh, you can really dramatically improve like the decisions you make, predictions you make. Uh, you can actually in some ways even forecast the future. This goes against pretty much everything yeah. we've all been taught yes. about what authority means, what does it mean to be an expert, right. what does it mean to be smart and wise. Right. Yeah, I think it, and it also goes against everything we've been taught about what groups are like. Nick, Connie, head up. James Sirwicky is not the first person to recognize this counterintuitive phenomenon. 
At the turn of the last century, a British scientist named Francis Galton came across a crowd of fairgoers guessing the weight of an ox. He collected the guesses and averaged them out. And the group had guessed that the ox would weigh 1,197 pounds. And it actually weighed 1,198 pounds. And this is not a fluke. Not a fluke. We decided to try an experiment ourselves in Times Square. So the idea is people are going to guess how many jelly beans are in here. Right. Do you want to have a guess how many uh, jelly beans are in here? Probably like 2,000. 390. 2,784. 334 in there. Like 3,000? 743. 2,005. 1,011. 10,000. What you're saying that this crowd is smarter than the average person? Oh, yeah. The crowd collectively will be much smarter than the average person. Now, Joe how many are really in there? We'll tell you the correct answer later. But meanwhile, it's off to the races where playing the odds usually pays off. Wow. Wow. That is extraordinary. Come on, baby! In some ways, it's actually the perfect example because the odds on horses, which you can see back there, that are set at the racetrack are set purely by the crowd. So every single person who bets actually affects the final outcome. So compared to any other kind of, you know, market or right. futures or this is one of the best examples. Yeah, it really is one of the best. Oh. The number four horse. It's a short trot from horse gamblers to stock traders. What you're essentially doing when you're buying a stock, whether you know it or not, is offering up your judgment as to how much that stock is really worth. It's very hard for even the smartest money managers to do better than the stock market as a whole. Which is why so-called index funds with holdings from an entire sector of a market beat managed funds where experts pick and choose stocks. In a given year, the index fund is likely to beat something like 65% of the comparably managed mutual funds. And over a decade, it's probably going to be 80%. John Vogel ought to know. He's the legendary founder of the Vanguard Group. And over an investment lifetime, the index fund, amazing as it may sound, is apt to beat about 90 to 95 percent of all active investors. But wait a minute. What about the 1990s stock market bubble? Crowds go wrong when diversity really breaks down. Crowds also break down when people start paying too much attention to what the, those around them are doing. If we're trying to make a good decision or predict the future, the knowledge we need is buried in the heads of people who you would never think to ask. Though these days, thanks to the internet, you can ask anyone, anytime, anywhere. News Futures is one of those internet sites where anybody can sign on and bet on just about everything, from the odds of an epidemic to the Super Bowl. People play for prizes and bragging rights. And corporations use the website's information to help market their goods. Emil Servan Schreiber is the CEO. And this is more than just sport and games. There's real information to be gathered from these Absolutely. markets. Absolutely. It taps directly into the collective intelligence of the audience. Robin Gordon plays News Futures. She's divorced and a mother of three and a part-time beautician. It's a wonderful predictor. Um, I would say probably nine times out of ten, the way it happens in real life is the way that it happens on News Futures. Um, the players are very knowledgeable. There's a lot of people out there with a lot of internal smarts. And talk about smart. Harvard Business School professor Anita Albersi not only trusts the wisdom of the masses, she helps market it to Hollywood. So the Hollywood Stock Exchange is a game uh, where uh, people can bet on the success of movies. One movie that's coming out is uh, Glory Road on uh, January 13th, and, uh, and uh, currently the, the market thinks that this movie will do uh, the price is 35 Hollywood dollars, which means that the market expects that the movie will do about 35 million dollars uh, in the first four weeks of its release. Right now, betting on the upcoming Oscars is big. Reese Witherspoon is in the lead for Best Actress. Heath Ledger for Best Actor, Brokeback Mountain for Best Picture. Last year, folks playing this site beat just about all the experts with a perfect 8 out of 8 in the top categories. So there you have it. 
experts often know less than they think. A group of amateurs, more than any one person knows. And people can be trusted. It's an old lesson that James Surowiecki is sharing anew. A lesson easily forgotten. If you go back to Machiavelli and the Prince, and what does he say? He says, do not surround yourself with yes men. Uh, and that this is what the prince has to watch out for. Um, but apparently when it comes down to it, it's just very hard to follow that good advice. Oh, and we almost forgot. The actual number of jelly beans in our jar was 1,369. The crowd's average guess was 1,247. No single guess was closer. All right. So, what what uh, what were some of the takeaways you had from that? What what like maybe real life situation have you encountered that uh, that that you've seen a similar effect? Am I on? Yeah, you're on. Um, okay. I would just say <clears throat> gambling, I mean, I have an experience of gambling um, and it, yeah, it really is. It just, it's, it's very addictive, very, very addictive. So um, I don't know, I guess, I guess I agree with the video. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so especially the horse racing. So what the, the message yeah. there was that uh, uh, individual experts, you know, uh, or, or small groups of experts may not be as knowledgeable. Because, um, you know, for the most part, we call that street smarts. we got a lot of people that are out there that uh, have real world experience and they see trends. And as a group of, of uh, non-experts, we can see a general proximity to um, good decision making or, or creative problem solving or something like that, as opposed to individual or small groups of experts, right? So, uh, and, and we're kind of encountering that now you know, we brought up QAnon before and the conspiracy theories and, um, you know, who are they not listening to? So we kind of, we've kind of seen a whirlwind, a very similar situation where people believe that, that, that there is wisdom in groups. Um, and on top of that, there's almost this defiance that we don't trust that the people are making decisions, right? So in a lack of information or a lack of believable information for people, they tend to go with the shortest answer. Right, so they're going with the wisdom of groups, which is actually not serving them well. Okay, they're they're going with information that is incorrect, that is unverified, and has no scientific backing whatsoever. So we can kind of see that on both spectrums. We can see where it can be a good thing, maybe make it a wager with a horse, or maybe uh, uh, or, or uh, but uh, not listening to stocks. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm multitasking here myself. Uh, so anyway, the bad, the downside to that is um, people, if they mistrust their authorities or mistrust the, the experts, then we can see the likelihood of making faulty decisions based on bad information from, from uh, larger groups. All right. Uh, any questions? Anybody have any questions for me? All right. Well, if I think so. what's that? Go ahead. No, I'm just saying I don't think so. I had a question. 